new choices, new players, new models of care. You know consumer first healthcare is everywhere. For us to build the future, to see what's new, we gotta look at the world from a different point of view. Consumer innovation ain't going away. I say it's here to stay, today it leads the way. We gotta drop the silos, we're all the same team. Experience, business, tech, and marketing. So join us now, join the revolution. Consumer first health is the evolution. Status quo, or like status, no. Yeah, this is the healthcare rep. Yo, come on, let's go. Welcome back to the leading podcast about consumer innovation. I'm Jared Johnson, founder of the consumer advisory firm Shift Forward Health, and here's what's going to go down today. We have the flavor of the week about new wellness offerings from Eli Lilly and Mayo Clinic. Is direct-to-consumer digital health changing course, changing shape, or both? And what can we learn from some of these latest product launches? I'll talk about that. Then Ben Tingy returns to talk all things consumer innovation from his point of view as innovation manager with Advocate Health's innovation and commercialization team. We talk about everything from general catalyst to Neuralink as Ben ranges far and wide in his assessment of what's happening and how to let the future shape our progress today. It's time to dive right in. Are you ready? Let's go. Flavor of the Week. Is direct-to-consumer digital health changing course, changing shape, or both? And what can we learn from some of the latest product launches? Rock Health reports that the percentage of digital health startups selling direct-to-consumer might see a rebound after a couple of years of dropping. They point to two announcements that were made within days of each other. First, Eli Lilly launched Lilly Direct. It's a partnership with digital health startups that connects consumers who are looking to treat diabetes, migraines, or obesity with providers and home delivery of Lilly medications. It's just one of the latest moves from pharma to get into digital health. Day Days later, Mayo Clinic announced the Mayo Clinic Diet Medical Weight Loss Program. The new service offers clinical care and virtual check-ins provided by Amwell, prescriptions and refills including GLP-1s, a care coordinator to help participants navigate the process, meal plans and recipes, at-home fitness plans for resistance training, group coaching, and an online community. The direct-to-consumer or DTC health market is always fascinating to watch because it reminds us of the steps that many patients take prior to seeking medical care. And at a time when journey maps are making a comeback in healthcare institutions, it's still a challenge to adequately address those journeys because they're not linear and they don't just include choosing between providers. It's not uncommon to explore weight loss options from a friend, from an ad, from a pharma company, from Googling or all of the above before asking your doctor. And while the traditional healthcare system continues to say that there isn't money in prevention, McKinsey estimates that the U.S. wellness market is $480 billion as of January 2024 and it's growing at 5-10% to per year. They also say that 82% of U.S. consumers consumers now consider wellness a top or important priority in their everyday lives. That right there, that's the insight, folks. That's the reason to pay attention to DTC offerings. Do everyday people consider health care to be a priority in the same way? Not necessarily. People want to be well. There's a difference. And they'll exhaust a lot of options to feel better other than what's discussed in a rushed appointment that took too long to book and too long to sit in a waiting room, all to have too little time to speak with the actual doctor. Consumers explore lots of options for their health and well-being. Sometimes medical care is what they need, but a more convenient digital option is what they ask for. As we consider how to expand the impact of consumer innovations, let's evaluate what we learn about consumer behavior from some of these new wellness-based digital health offerings, because that's where a lot of real journey maps might lead. That's another way that we'll build the healthcare of tomorrow. And that's the flavor of the Week. All right, everyone, let's get into the flow. Give it up, please, for our return guest. Ben Tingy is back with us. Ben is an innovation manager with Advocate Health and a trend spotter is what I like to refer to him as. But uh, Ben, welcome back. Jared, thanks so much, buddy. It's great to be back. Uh, What I was excited to hear was, first and foremost, some of the changes going on at Advocate or just maybe some of the evolutions, I guess, of the structure itself. Let's start off with the two-minute version of you. Who's Ben? What are you up to? And then would love to hear a little bit about kind of what's going on on at Advocate Health, but let's start with you. Happy to share all of that. About me, so I am husband to Jackie and dad to five rambunctious boys. That is really all about me that's important. My wife's amazing. She's a mental health therapist and it was probably a good thing in our house to have a therapist in-house to uh, 
help us navigate this parenting and, and life and everything. She's amazing. So my role, I'm an innovation manager, as you mentioned, at Advocate Health in the Innovation and Commercialization Division. At least that's what our name is as of uh, the date of recording. And Advocate Health is the combined entity that formed with the merger of Atrium Health, which was based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and had facilities and services in the Carolinas and Georgia with Advocate Aurora Health, which was based in Illinois, Wisconsin. And so those two organizations came together to form Advocate Health, but both Atrium Health and Advocate Aurora Health retain their brand identity in their markets. And so Advocate Health acts as the parent kind of corporate structure, I guess. But here locally, for example, in Charlotte, where I live, it's still Atrium Health and we'll stay that way. But yeah, what else about me, Jared? I co-hosted a Sherpa's Guide to Innovation podcast for five or six years. And as you said, was have been on here before and have been a big fan of everything that Jared's been up to with the Consumer First Society and the just the passion for driving consumer innovation in healthcare. And so glad to be in that circle of people who are advocating for that work. Yeah, you know, I came across a comment recently. It happens when I clean off my desk and it doesn't happen as often as it should. But apparently I'd scribbled down on a post-it note from a consumer first call a couple months back. It was under buried under a stack of papers and it said, don't lose our path to becoming revolutionaries. It was something like that. And I'm like, okay, I vaguely remember hearing about that in one of the calls a couple months ago. And it kind of struck me because that's right. That was one of the things that has united a lot of people who have come together in that group is the thought of there are some revolutionary aspects of the conversations that have been had there. So way, way too much of a look into the dirtiness and the disorganization in my life. But that's it. It's true. It's great to be connected with others who share that desire of finding whatever whatever means there are. And it's, it's funny, maybe this kind of lays the groundwork for our conversation today, because a little bit has to do with how we see the world, right? Our perspective, and the things that limit our view very much lead to the questions we ask, the way we answer those questions, and what we're looking for ultimately. And what got me on that train of thought was just this realization that consumer innovation can happen in a lot of different ways and a lot of different forms. And so it can be within the traditional healthcare setting, within existing provider organizations, health systems, health plans, many of which have been around for 100, 200 years, providing care, helping communities, helping people get well. There are also these non-traditional players and entrants, and and I've referred to them less as disruptors lately, as I understand kind of the, the connotation of that within others who don't want to feel like they are being disrupted. And I totally get that. So at least the non-traditional players who we talk about a lot on this show. But there are revolutionary ways to improve healthcare for consumers, is what this boils down to, on both of those paths, the traditional care side and the non-traditional care side. And so with that elongated intro, I wonder just kind of what you're seeing out there. Maybe it's on one of those paths on the traditional side or the non-traditional side or both. But you want to give us the lay of the land of just kind of what trends you're seeing when we're talking about consumer-focused healthcare? Yeah, happy to share some perspectives. And the first thing that comes to mind, and this is just based on some things that I've seen recently with conversations with a lot of startups and other things is, and I'm sure you are as well, we're seeing AI everywhere. And I'm not an expert in artificial intelligence and I know enough to, I think, and I probably am even wrong about this, to be able to spot some of the performative versus the substantive use cases and opportunities in AI. I think as AI quickly went up the hype cycle, and and to be clear, AI has actually been around for a really long time. I think the mindshare that it has now created in consumer culture, especially last year with ChatGPT and other things, just really launched it really fast up the hype cycle. And I think it's peaked and I think it's actually coming down a little bit. You hear venture capitalists and others starting to complain a little bit about seeing so many pitches of startups that just have AI everywhere and just a lot of jargon. And and they're saying like, just because you've got AI doesn't mean that it's anything special. AI, and this is something that Clayton Christensen always talked about in his theories was the technology is not what is 
the value proposition. It, that's not what's disruptive. That's not what's really unique. Technology acts as an enabler for a business model that delivers the value. And so AI is not the value proposition. It's not the business model. It is a technology enabler that helps to deliver a value proposition. And so I think we all became you know, really enamored with AI. And what I something that I've been thinking a lot about is in consumer innovation, there is a lot that we have to change to make healthcare more consumer focused. And we often think about the things we need to add in order to do that, new features, new tools, new processes, new whatever. And I think when, pre- when people approach AI as another thing on top of all this other stuff, I think that's where the power of AI is actually lost. I think the real power of AI is, is in reduction, in reducing complexity and turning it into something simple. I mean, if you think about chat GPT, that's essentially what it is. It's people ask simple questions and it spits back simple responses, combing through all of this data, these large language models. and But essentially, it's helping a user simplify what they're after. That's where I'm hopeful for AI to have its real impact in healthcare is is to improve things like health literacy or financial literacy, where it's helping people sort through all the complexity of their healthcare bill or to sort through the complexity of why something got denied by their insurance company or the complexity of the science behind their diagnosis. Uh, I mean, can you imagine the from an educational standpoint, here's a really simple way to understand what's wrong with your body right now and what we're doing to try to fix it and how this particular medicine or this particular procedure is going to try to help you and simplifying that to a way that people can understand and, and feel. And, and so again, I, I think AI is, is great when, when applied appropriately. And, I, and I, I just think that its real power is going to be unleashed when it simplifies and reduces and subtracts from complexity instead of adding layers and layers and layers on top of already existing services or or resources. Well, I love the the application of that right away to not just reducing the back end complexity because consumers and patients for the most part, they know it's complicated, but they don't know why and they don't know what that means. They don't understand revenue cycle. They don't understand clinical workflows. And do they need to, to have a better experience? I don't know, maybe a little bit, but I don't know that's the, the full answer. And so if these things can happen in the background even, If complexity can be reduced and there are fewer clicks and there are fewer applications to open and and fewer things happening, who is the, the one responsible to do that? That's always a good question. If somebody can take that on, though, and recognize that that is... Ultimately, a thing that that I would make a case leads to more people seeking the care and getting the care that they need. There's a lot of research about people who avoid care because of the cost. There's also plenty who avoid care because of the complexity of it and just the, the overall experience. And so that's that segment that there's a business case to be made to address them more. And then it's like, well, who who's responsible for that? Who helps implement something that that makes that journey a little easier that leads to people yeah. getting the care they need and and you know the more we talk about that i see the usefulness of of ai and other tools that will emerge uh, that will sit on top of that but i think it does come back to what you just said of of having that from the start be the question that we ask how do we make things how do we reduce the complexity yeah and i think ai can be a great way to bring us all together because i i think you have groups that are coming at it from the tech side saying, I want to make healthcare better. And, and my experience with AI is, in the, is on the tech aspects of it. And then you have others that are coming at it from, well, my expertise is clinical. And so that's, that's what I'm bringing to it. But when, you, when, we're, when we can combine that, as you said, who, who's the one leading that charge? Everyone could make a case why it should be them or you know, over others, why it should be clinical over tech, why it should be tech over clinical. And I think eventually that'll get sorted out. And it's the reality is it's got to be both somehow. And so, yeah, I agree. I, I hope that it can do much to lower the fear, lower the friction, lower the just the complexity of this whole system. I love that. And it's a conversation that I used to have years ago. I think I got stuck in trying to be very prescriptive of tech should lead this. 
or clinical should lead this. Or even at times, the marketing slash business side has a case to at least be at the table. And I got caught up in that myself, thinking that was a one size fits all for everybody. It's very much not. Just like there's there's no reason why every organization should have the exact same titles in their C-suite executives. For some, it makes sense to have a chief information officer, chief transformation officer, a chief digital officer, a chief consumer officer, all of which are out there. But do you have to have each of those things? Well, I would imagine it depends on the other capabilities of those on the leadership team. So yeah, I've, I've caught myself uh, having to recalibrate a little bit and say, there's not a one size fits all with the leadership hats there. And, and that's absolutely part of this discussion. Another part I feel like is even just understanding where consumer innovation fits in. So it's a term we've been latching onto a lot this season and the last season here on the show about a specific area of innovation. And so a lot of it is digital to your point, but not all of it, especially when you're talking about reducing systems, that's typically not digital only. So that that's a lot of team building, communication, change management. It's really change management for the most part. And the term consumer innovation, what I've been using as a definition lately is a product or service that is designed and built with the aim of improving the consumer experience. And that can be before, during, or after care. Where traditional care, I think, really excels is the patient experience conversation that has evolved over the last eight to 10 years, and especially the last three to five. I think, I think COVID and since COVID, since the peaks of it, we've really seen an emphasis and a recognition that this has to be part of the conversation. And this has to be a priority, in fact. So that's maybe a little bit before care, mostly during care, maybe a little bit after care, but probably not 90 to 95% of time in your life when you're a consumer and you're not being actively seen. So I think a lot of innovation happens during those times as well. And a lot of engagement has to happen for you to have that better experience when you're a patient, if that makes sense. There's just, there are things that need to happen and be available so that when yeah when it's time for you to seek care again that experience is better what do you think about that do you think first and foremost that definition i'd love to hear your thought on on that definition of consumer innovation but just in general how to continue to show like how do we keep showing the value of focusing in this area because there are so many other priorities out there the operative word that stood out to me in that definition is design at advocate something that we apply often in our work is jobs to be done theory which is a theory about consumer behavior. It's a mindset, it's a skill set, it's a tool set. It has wonderful, really its power is in organizing around a common understanding of what consumers truly desire, the progress that they're trying to make and in which context. And so from a consumer innovation standpoint, using jobs to be done as a tool to drive it in my opinion, what, what that does is it gets everyone on the same page. It creates an understanding of this is what the patient or the consumer's desired progress is within this particular circumstance or context. And then what that does is because you have that insight, it organizes all of the resulting work after that. Now the marketing team knows what to do. Now the clinical team knows what to do. Now the operations team knows what to do. Because everyone is delivering on the same thing, trying to create value to help nail that job to be done that the patient has. And so the before, during, and after, a lot of those answers get answered just by understanding better the consumer's job to be done in that circumstance. And so a major benefit of jobs to be done as well is that it just reduces wasted time. So often we spend time building things that people don't want or they don't need or they are suboptimal according to the consumer's perspective. And health systems and startups, we don't have those resources anymore. If we had them at all before, we certainly don't now to be working on things that aren't going to be driving impact and aren't going to be helping consumers make their desired progress. We, we don't have the time, we don't have the money to do that anymore. And so jobs to be done helps us move away from a correlative understanding of consumer behavior and get down to a causal understanding of consumer behavior. And it, it cuts through all the unnecessary work and unnecessary things. And, and so if, yeah, from, from a consumer innovation standpoint and, and your definition, there are tools like jobs to be done that help in the design of those products and services so that they can be consumer oriented and consumer focused. And so I'd, I'd advocate for everyone to look into those tools and, and to 
use them. It offers a new way to see the world and a new way to understand patients and consumers. And I think that alone will do a lot to drive consumer innovation. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we are talking about the tools that we need to be able to do that. And a comparison I make frequently is just having the the fortune of looking back at what digital transformation has looked like over the last 15 to 20 years, but particularly in healthcare, wh- everything from the EHR side to the digitization of other things. And digital transformation is more than just digitizing existing processes and workflows. As we know, it is the ability to actually create new solutions that weren't available previously. And I do think we're in a very small scale way able to look at the progress, the slow adoption and progress of digital transformation in a lot of different ways and say, what can we learn from that when we're talking about a consumer transformation? I don't know if it's you know a capital T transformation that it'll ever approach the same scale as digital transformation, but we can learn from some of the things that led to success at the end of the day. And success can be measured by where we're able to reach some outcomes or some business objectives better, faster, with fewer resources, et cetera. There's a lot of different, you know, we could probably spend a whole episode just talking about like what those objectives could be and, and still are when it comes to digital transformation. When we talk about consumer innovations, the reason why I like focusing on that is because it does feel like it helps make that move of what you just explained jobs to be done can do, which is make that move from a correlational understanding to a causal understanding. I love that. I think that's a deeper level of going beyond a checkbox mentality of, yeah, we asked somebody what they thought about it. And and we checked the box that we did some user testing. (laughs) Whereas anything that is designed, you latched onto the being designed around a consumer's need or their expectation or their desire that they don't even express to you. That designing part is key. And that's got to be the center of the change management process because then you build very different things <laughs> when that's the case. And that's the point of, of, in my mind, referring to consumer innovations instead of just consumer-centered healthcare. Because we can say, yeah, hey, we put stuff on the website now. We're, con- more, we're more consumer-centered. And I think it's just opening people's eyes to the vision of where we want to go with all of this. And so I, I, I love that. What, what else are you paying attention to, either inside or outside of traditional care? There's a lot of interesting stuff going on, Jared. Paying attention to... <laughs> All the hubbub about uh, General Catalyst purchasing Summa Health, the health system. And I think that's just going to be a very interesting experiment. And I don't have... A lot of people have really strong opinions one way or the other. From my perspective, I think it's just a giant learning opportunity. And I hope it goes well, both <laughs> hopefully for General Catalyst investors, but also more importantly for the patients that that I I hope it can reveal opportunities for innovation and and more of a consumer focus and better efficiency, better tools. Uh, So I I hope it can go well. What I, a challenge that I foresee is with all the transformation General Catalyst will want to make, it needs a willing workforce. If you're going to create this learning laboratory, then maybe there's a gigantic culture shift that's going to have to happen. And Maybe they've underestimated that, but so that's something I'm I'm looking into, and I think it'd be very interesting to follow and see what happens. Some other things, maybe just on the side, I, all the discussion recently about longevity and all the research coming out about yeah, I mean the document like there was a documentary that came out I think last year on Disney Limitless with Chris Hemsworth and just about aging and. And really, it, it's a lot of the Blue Zones stuff. Just to, if you can do that your whole life, then you'll end up living a lot longer. If you if you get good exercise, if you sleep well, if you eat well, if you have good social relationships, and these aren't surprising things, but the relationship now to longevity and, and all that has been an interesting connection to see. And something additionally that I've been looking into that I think is exciting and, and I hope can become a good consumer innovation and that's uh, wearables. There's some there's some reports coming out that in China they think they have figured out how to do non-invasive glucose monitoring and they can put it into a smartwatch or blood pressure monitoring Apple has talked about, you know, maybe future versions of the Apple Watch will have a, a blood pressure monitoring technology and 
a lot of that stuff exists currently, but it's a little invasive or it's bulky or it's not as sort of consumer friendly as just having it really accessible on a smartwatch or in a smart ring or whatever you know other device you're using. But I think the opportunity for large groups of people quantifying their health information and, and the things that we'll learn from that, but also how it will help people tailor their health and, and bring awareness and people, well, if, if I eat this food at this time, it spikes my blood sugar. So maybe I need to figure out how to eat better or or maybe I need to go take a walk afterwards or uh, so just how it will influence general health and keep people healthy. So I think you talked about tools that can help before care, during care, after care, things like wearables can help in all three phases and probably even more from a preventative standpoint. So I'm excited about what that will mean. There's some futuristic stuff <laughs> that I've also been reading that uh, is maybe a little, a little spooky. I mean, you know, replacing body parts and creating, you know, bionic arms that are stronger and, you know, can live forever and, you know, all the Neuralink stuff. I think there was a report that brain implant, you know, someone, someone had it put in their brain and, and that's now up and running with, with one human person now. And so who knows what we'll see in the future. I'm sure 10, 20, 30 years from now, it will be <laughs> a wacky world, but mostly what I'm hoping is that it can just help people be healthy, help people live longer, fuller, happier lives. And so yeah, a lot, a lot of cool stuff to be watching. It really is. You know, it reminds me a lot of probably nine or 10 years ago, what really was drawing my attention were some of the things you mentioned were like very early stage wearables were the, the first Apple Watch were where Fitbit was at the time. And to see how those things have come along, they are part of consumer transformation. And you're right, it's a different objective, which the objective of a lot of traditional primary care, for instance, is increase access, improve the experience, where the objective of consumer tech in a lot of cases is to put that data or that ability to to track something about my health in my hands without it being bulky. You mentioned, yeah, the tech has existed in a lot of cases for a lot of these things. But if it's not in a way that that is easy, that is convenient, then that's also not as adopted either. And on the clinical side too, if the provider doesn't if they're if they're just getting a table of data, you know, read from the device, how many want to actually spend any time interpreting that? They're not getting reimbursed for the in interpreting the data in a lot of cases, in most cases. So there are a lot of those same triggers, which are what's easier, what's more convenient. That's what's going to lead us to a better place, ultimately help people be healthier. So I love that. I love the thought. I think it's important for us to look to the future and, and to look at, sure, what's happening now, but there's going to be a next gen of that device coming out and it is going to have yeah. something new on it. So, you know, let's not just look at the current state, you know, throw up our hands and just say, oh, there's nothing we can do here or this it's too much or it's too little. I think it's important to see what is coming and how they're being iterated and what is being added and to see if that is the direction that does make consumer tech adoption, for instance, become a little easier and a little more, mm -hmm. a little more widespread. That absolutely has to do with it. It was Omada Health just a couple of weeks ago that we had Wei Li Xiao on the show. And he's explaining that if a home health device can come pre-wired so that you don't have to set up the Wi-Fi for it or the Bluetooth for it, if the connection is already there when you open the box, then that increases the likelihood that it will be used in the home. Yep. So that that could be a simple step, you know, and that I would guess that came up during a design process. So it's exciting to hear what's possible. And you're right, that that's an example of reducing complexity. Something that was probably so simple, it was off the radar screen in a lot of cases. It's not the thing you lead with in all the marketing and the press and everything. And yet he was pointing to data that showed that made a difference in people adopting this device and, and ultimately getting their own care. So it's fascinating to see. Yeah. And it's often those simple things that are the real barriers it's <laughs> to adoption. It's the, well, I don't have Wi-Fi in my house. Oh, well, okay. Then none of this other cool tech is even going to work if you don't have Wi-Fi. So it's, yeah. The, the basics it really is all right well any any final thoughts anything else we haven't talked about or anything that's just kind of like on your radar screen anything about the future of care that you think is is interesting um, well maybe this will be a little bit of a different direction I, i'm seeing i've been trying to focus a lot more on the positive lately there's so much that's broken about healthcare and so many problems and inequities and all kinds of things and i don't i don't mean to diminish those things or to say that they don't exist but it can be demotivating to only focus on all the 
problems and maybe working in corporate innovation where <laughs> where wins are far and few between focusing on the positive is is just a good mindset and, and to celebrate when good things happen and i, I had an, an interesting experience this weekend where um, i was at a friend's house and he had a friend there who approached me and this was you know a guy who is from a more rural part of south carolina really bright guy but you know from his culture mental health was not something that was really ever talked about it was you know, especially as a male and he said hey i understand you work in healthcare i, I have some questions like how can i talk with somebody about my mental health and we had this really great conversation and i'm seeing a lot of positive things happening where people are particularly men are more willing to talk about that stuff than they have in the past I'm seeing, you know, more interest in in people trying to eat more healthy foods and exercise more and being outside. I mean, there are funny fads and th- I mean, you know, cold plunges and other things. And but if it gets people talking about health and then working together to you know help their friends, help their neighbors be healthy as well, I, I just see there's a lot of there's a lot of positive stuff going on, and that sometimes gets missed or or lost. And and you know, we are consumers. We talk about consumer innovation, but that's all of us. We are the consumers of healthcare services. We're the consumers of food and exercise and sleep. And so we're, we're always talking about us. And if we ourselves aren't <laughs> living more healthy and, and more fully and abundantly, then, then what's the point? And so just a reminder to focus on the positive and, and see that there are lots of good things happening and good policy changes, good technology improvements. So there's so much good. And I don't want that to get lost in, in some of the messages of doom and gloom. Well, focusing on the positive is a perfect place for us to wrap for this episode, Ben. It's been a pleasure. And I want to thank you for your time here. I've had the absolute pleasure of speaking with Ben Tingey from Advocate Health. Looking forward to having you come back again sometime. But thanks for joining us today. Happy to, Jerry. This was a blast. Thanks, man. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Tell your colleagues to tune in for all the awesomeness, then leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. See our full lineup at shiftforwardhealth.com. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. And remember, we might have a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we'll get there faster together. Thanks again. Thank you.